Hey, I just wanted to come up and say thank you. That was such a great gig. I loved your solo on Stella by Starlight. That was such a cool lick you played in the bridge. I don't play licks, man. Hi everyone, I am the Saxophone Oracle, and this week's question is, did John Coltrane or Charlie Parker play licks? Well, the answer simply is yes. Of course they did. Without question, they played licks. Um, so we could end the video there now that I've answered it, but uh, I want to go into it a little more in depth, and then I'm going to show you my two favorite Coltrane licks and my two favorite Charlie Parker licks. So when I started this channel, I wasn't really interested in making any videos about licks per se. I think there's enough of it out there. I didn't think I had anything to contribute. But recently I was going through an online saxophone forum and I saw this person uh, posted a question. Innocently enough, completely legitimate question. Um, they said, hey everyone, can you help me out? I'm interested in learning some John Coltrane licks. Is there anything you could recommend that's not too difficult for a beginner? Cool, great, right? So of course some people answered with, well, you know, learn the opening phrase to Mr. PC or maybe start by learning this melody, etc. But of course, being the internet and what it is, there's people who also have to chime in, the, you know, the people I'm talking about who live in some kind of delusional fantasy world where they're somehow saxophone or jazz experts or Coltrane scholars, you know, and they have to say, well, Coltrane never played licks, you know, and then they even go further, of course, making this poster try and make him feel like an idiot for asking a legitimate question, you know, like, how dare you insinuate the messiah of jazz is anything less than immortal, or, you know, if you had just listened to Coltrane for 10 minutes, you would know how ridiculous your question is. Of course he didn't play licks, he's a true improviser, blah, 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 blah. All right, we've all seen it. So I wanted to talk about this, because first of all, Saxophone, it's a really small world. Jazz, it's even smaller. In the grand scheme of things, it's really insignificant. It's really unimportant, right? There's, and, and there's so few of us who actually share a love for this instrument, for this music. So in these forums, it would be really nice if we were kind to one another, okay? So if you have to say something like that, keep it to yourself. And then aside from that is like, what a ridiculous opinion to have. Of course, these people played licks. Everyone has licks. Bach had licks. Mozart has licks. Beethoven had licks. Stravinsky, Bird, Louis Armstrong, Train, the list goes on and on, right? We play certain phrases. This is a language. What makes a sound unique is the language we use to communicate. There are certain idiomatic things that players play over and over again that makes them sound the way they do, and there should be no question of this. And really, the evidence is there in the recordings, right? Like um, Coltrane, we have, I don't know how many, 20 outtakes from the Giant Step session, where you can listen to each of his solos back to back, and they've been transcribed, so you can read along too. You know, and from take to take, they sound remarkably similar. Why is that? Well, because he's playing the same stuff. Of course, he's improvising, they're not identical solos, but he's playing the same vocabulary, the same licks. You know, how many live versions are there of Train playing impressions where he takes a solo for 20 minutes? Are you seriously trying to tell me that he doesn't repeat himself or there are not things he's playing that are idiomatic to him? You know, Bird, like there's the famous recording of Bird, the, the one and only video that we know about of, of Bird actually playing live on, on video, him and, him and uh, Dizzy are playing Hot House. And in a one chorus solo, he literally verbatim plays the same lick twice, okay? And there's nothing wrong with that. Does this make these people less genius? No, does it make the music less good? No, of course not. Now one can argue, okay, these are innovators, these people invented the language, sure. I'm not going to argue that, but nonetheless, they play idiomatic things. There are things that make them sound the way they do, you know, vo vocabulary. So maybe you don't like the term lick, maybe you call it vocabulary, maybe you call it patterns, maybe you call it language, whatever it is, it is there, and these players obviously play it. 
that's it. And I mean, let's like look at a guy like Thelonious Monk. What an innovator, what an individual. But like, did he not repeat himself constantly? Of course he did. And for that matter, in his case, over the span of his entire career, he kept playing the same maybe 50 tunes over and over again. Does it make him any less great? No. Does it make the music any less valuable or special? No, of course not. So, I mean, that's it. This is, this is, I mean, for me, this is key. I mean, we have certain vocabulary. And then us as students of the music, you know, we have all this history before us that we can take from a little bit from here and a little bit from there. And what we don't like, we put aside. And how we assemble it together in our own unique way and add our own twist to things is how we come up with our own unique individual sound. It's just the way it is, right? Like Louis Armstrong did that, and then Bird developed on that, and Lester Young, and then Coltrane came along, Joe Henderson, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? It's taking from those who came before us and putting our own twist on it. Okay, so let's get to the music. We're gonna start with Coltrane. Uh, this is my first favorite Coltrane lick. And this one, in fact, is so popular, someone along the way put a name to it. I don't know if you've heard this before, but this is called the Big T. So T for train, the big T. And it goes like this. <laughs> Sound familiar? Sure, because Coltrane played it all the time. It is a 2-5-1 lick resolving to major, and it sounds awesome. So if you've ever heard Coltrane, you've probably heard that lick. And if you've ever heard anyone who came after Train, you know, Garzon, Berganzi, whoever, Brecker, you've probably heard them play that or some variation of that. Why? Because it sounds amazing. Okay, my number two favorite Coltrane lick. This one is also so famous that it too has a name. This one happens to be named after the great jazz educator, David Baker. I'm sure David Baker didn't invent this lick, and I'm pretty positive Coltrane didn't play it either, but he sure played it a whole heck of a lot, especially on the recording uh, Lush Life. So if you're not familiar with the John Coltrane record Lush Life, do yourself a favor, go and get a copy of it, listen to it because this is Coltrane at his best. I mean, he is in top, top form playing wise and every single solo, every single phrase on this record is just gold. It's, it's magic, it's art that is worthy of deeper, deeper study. So on this recording, he plays all over it, over and over again, this lick known as David Baker. It is based on the diminished scale, and it works great on two five ones or two five ones where the two chord is a minor seven flat five. It works great as well. Okay. Right, we've heard this before. There you have it, my two favorite John Coltrane licks, The Big T and David Baker. Okay, now I'm gonna demonstrate my two favorite Charlie Parker licks. Uh, this one we've all heard, again, it's a two, five, one lick. There are a million different variations of how we can resolve out of this to the one chord, but what is super idiomatic to Charlie Parker is the beginning of the lick. You've all heard it, so it goes something like this. Right? We could resolve out of it another way. Uh, but it's, it's really the beginning of that phrase. Right? We hear Bird play that everywhere, anywhere there's a 251. Sounds amazing. Now my second favorite Charlie Parker lick, this one's super simple. It's basically an embellishment of a major chord. And um, you know, he uses it as a phrase ending or something on, on the tonic when he lands on one. I suppose we could do it in minor as well. And there you have it. 
So I'm putting the PDFs of those on the website, www.thesaxophoneoracle.com, so you can go and learn them too. I am the saxophone oracle. That's what I wanted to talk about this week. So did the great jazz masters like Train, Joe Henderson, Charlie Parker, Louis Armstrong, did they play licks? Yes, of course they did. Uh, I just demonstrated a couple for you. And the other takeaway from this is please be nice to each other in the online forums. We all just love this music so we could be nice and kind to each other. I hope you found this information useful. I hope you liked the video. Please remember to like, share, and subscribe. Uh, this week, I'd like to put out a call to action. I'd like everyone out there to learn the Big T Lick. So if you have an Instagram or you have a Facebook or whatever, learn this lick, make a short clip, post it. Hashtag Big T, hashtag Coltrane, hashtag the Saxophone Oracle, whatever you want to do. But I think uh, we should get this out there for that person who is interested in Coltrane Licks. That's a great one. Um, so thanks as always for watching. Uh, I wish you all a great week. Happy, happy practicing. Bye for now.